I was selected in 1973 to begin the Army's initial entry rotary wing program. That is the first level of flight training for the United States Army. I served for 27 years in the Army, and during that 27 years, I saw a magical transformation. I was at the beginning of what they called the Great WAC Expansion, which not only opened fields for women in aviation eventually, but also women in all sorts of fields. The country had come to realize that their educated daughters were trained and raring to go in fields that had never been open to them before. It was not too many years later that I saw that some of these women who had been trained in the military and aviation, in helicopters and airplanes, had left the service and were flushing out the ranks of commercial aviation. Now that's not to say that I'm old enough to remember the first woman who ever flew, because I don't. Women have been flying for decades before I ever even thought of flying. They've been flying as personal pleasure, they've been flying for uh, pay, and they had flown in support of military operations. It was, however, new that the Army was actively recruiting women to join the Army first, to be soldiers, and then to be trained in aviation. Well, I'm credited sometimes for kicking that door, but it's not so much I kicked down the door. It was the fact that the Army deliberately opened the door, and I chose to walk through it. I'm told I diminish um, how important that was, but, you know, to me, it's just living life. You know, you take on a challenge, you either like it or you don't like it. You take on another challenge. It's getting up every morning and going to work and doing the best you can and hoping that people realize you're doing the best you can and hoping it's good work. I never gave much serious thought to the fact that I was blazing a trail, but 27 years later, after many people had told me I had done so, I was able to look over my shoulder and realize that I was much more gratified by seeing so many women who had followed that open door, had even made it wider, had even taken on other doors to open in the aviation fields that I had not even considered. If I had gone down that path as the first, but the only woman helicopter pilot in the Army, it would have been a bittersweet experience. But as you'll see, there are women who have entered aviation, not just as pilots, but in other fields, other disciplines, and they have their very own stories to tell too. My name is Melissa Mathiason, and I'm the chief pilot at Sikorsky Global Helicopters in Coatesville, Pennsylvania. Sikorsky Global Helicopters is primarily a completion center for S76 C++ and the S92 Alpha. They also are a production facility, which means we manufacture the C++, the S76 C++. And later this year, we're gonna put out our first S92 that will be manufactured on site. In the flight office itself, we support the completions and production schedule. So if an uh, aircraft is produced, manufactured here, we do all the initial ground runs and test flights for that aircraft, making sure it's airworthy and that it meets all the FAA requirements and manufacturer's requirements for those aircraft. Then it's going to go into our completion center, and it's essentially outfitted with the interior, the avionics package, the paint scheme that the customer wants, and any other special items that they want in the aircraft. My name is Stacy Sheard. I'm a production test pilot for Sikorsky Aircraft Corporation. Basically, we're flying helicopters for the first time they've ever been flown. Um, uh, the production line of helicopters, this is their first flight. Might be the first time the engines are running in the helicopter. And so everything, as far as tests, we do it step by step. As soon as everybody signed off, all the mechanics, the avionics, everybody involved in building that helicopter, as soon as they've signed off that they're complete with their individual job and the helicopter is presented to us after it's been fully inspected, then we go through a series of checks to make sure everything inside the cockpit uh, is working and is operational. And then we pull it outside and we do uh, our first ground runs. Once all the ground operations are done and we're satisfied that that helicopter is safe and it is complete, everything's working as it should, then uh, it's time to commence the first flights. 
Um, well, my name is Amelia Earhart, and I work here at Angel City Air. I also work for CBS and sometimes for KCAL, who are two stations in a duopoly together. And my title is basically breaking news, aerial reporter in the helicopter. I sit in the back seat, and I'm also the camera operator, and I operate the HD Cineflex camera that's mounted on the front of the chopper. And basically, Chris and I, as a team, fly to any situation, whether it's traffic, breaking news, weather shot, or just general morning news during the morning show, we fly together as a team. Chris up front, me in the back seat, and we navigate our way through to whatever's going on, and I shoot it with the camera, and then I talk over that picture. Um, well, I'm a helicopter pilot uh, for CBS here in Los Angeles. Um, so what that means is I get up really early in the morning because I fly for the morning show. Um, and I fly around Amelia Earhart, who is our camera operator as well as the talent for the morning show, breaking news, uh, traffic. We do the morning show, Amelia and myself. Um, so my job is to fly Amelia around to the breaking news or whatever story we're covering uh, that morning specifically. And we'll be out there and be first on scene to get the coverage on the air. My name is Mandy Haskins and I'm a flight paramedic for Priority One Air Rescue. Um, being a flight medic, that means that we fly around in the helicopter and we go out and do search and rescue and pick up patients that are out in the field somewhere. It's really important in Alaska to have search and rescue helicopters for that simple fact that we don't have road systems everywhere like they do in the lower 48. Being able to hoist out of the helicopter is a really good way to be able to go in and get these people because we go in, we hover above where they are, we can hoist down, we can either just hoist them back up or we can put them in our litter system. We can start patient care on the ground or we can start it in the helicopter. Hoisting is a lot of fun. At first it was a little difficult when it was new. However, it's become a lot of fun because it tasks us with a challenge to maintain a very stable hover in one place with references that are different from when you're on the ground. You have a lot of uh, visual references that help you maintain that hover, but once you get high and you may not have any sort of a reference like a tree or a rock or you're on a, on a, where over terrain that is uh, falling away, it does make a quite a different challenge for holding the hover. It takes a lot of concentration and of course we've got teamwork in the cockpit. The pilot not flying is providing uh, altitude power information because we're we can't really look inside the helicopter we are focusing on our reference outside I own a helicopter company that primarily fights forest fires and uh, my job is making sure that everybody is uh, operating safely and that our customers needs are being met and that uh, everybody is operating within the regulations that they're supposed to be. Um, I don't really think that there is such a thing as a typical day because that's, that's one of the things that's so interesting about this business is it's so fast paced and changing all the time just by the very nature of how a helicopter itself operates. It doesn't operate within the confines of airports and runways and those types of things and so I find that overall the business itself is very much like that so um, my days are not typical one after the other and they can start very early in the morning and go until very late in the evening depending on what time zones my crews are working in and then in the interim you do all of your normal regular day-to-day -day stuff like banking and things like that that you do through a normal normal work day so they can be very very long and very full but that's part of the appeal. I'm Stacy Gandy I'm an aviation maintenance technician for Air Methods out of Denver Colorado. I hold an airframe and power plant license and also I'm a airworthiness inspector the FAA and uh, I uh, basically I'm called an on-site mechanic. I'm here for this helicopter only 24 hours, seven days a week. I, uh, I generally work here about five hours a day doing inspections and any maintenance I need to do. And then after that, I'm gonna call for the rest of the day. 
helicopter doesn't always break here, you know. And it, and it might be in a field or some place where they have a hard time even giving you directions to get to. So it's kind of interesting in that it's not standard and you have to be very flexible. My name is Heather Collins and my title is registered nurse, flight nurse at Aramed. Uh, I work for Tampa General and I basically have worked for Tampa General since 1975 and with this flight program since 1989. The duties here basically uh, encompass nursing care of the patient as well as the aviation aspect of flight nursing. Okay, a typical call, uh, it'll either be a scene call or an inner facility and a, and a scene call is when we go to the, the site of an accident and pick up the patients from there. They'll land us in either a field or whatever's close by to the, to the accident. Uh, we'll receive the patient from the paramedics who've cared for the patient on the scene, get report, do any interventions that might need to be necessary to stabilize the patient, we'll load them up in our aircraft and take them to the closest trauma center or stroke center, whatever the, whatever the, uh, the most appropriate place is for the patient. Well, my name is Caroline Kane. I'm a captain with Bristow Helicopters in Alaska. I fly Bell Helicopter 407 in a remote location on the north slope of the Brooks Range. I fly to pump station number four and it's located along the Trans-Alaska Pipeline. Working in a remote location, we only have about uh, 40 to 45 people on site at Pump 4. And being such a remote location, you really need to get along with the folks there, or otherwise it makes for not a very fun work environment. And we're on a two-week on, two-week off rotation. Uh, you can drive to Pump 4 on the Dalton Highway, or the Hall Road it's called, but that can take about eight hours, so that wouldn't be a, a very good commute. So we actually, Alieska actually charters an airline, and we fly in every other Thursday. Um, current pilot duties and, and responsibilities include oil spill response, weekly pipeline surveillance, we do uh, medevacs and external load operations, and also air support for the communication repeater sites. The area that Pump Station 4 covers, covers 208 miles of the pipeline and we cover from pump station number one to milepost 208. So they're all in milepost miles, pipeline miles. And the weekly surveillance that we actually do, we'll actually have an observer with us, security observer. We'll fly about 300 feet off of the ground, about 100 knots, so it's a lot of fun flying, low like that, low level flying. And the observer will then look out the window, check the integrity of the pipe, make sure there hasn't been any changes. My name is Shan Shope, and I am a seasonal contract pilot for Bristow, Alaska. I have been up here two previous seasons, and I've also worked tours, and I've done a little bit of EMS. But I think my passion is mostly in utility, and especially long line precision, long line type work. As a long line pilot, you, you have what they call an external load. So if you've ever seen a firefighting helicopter where there's a line that comes down below, and in firefighting you have a water bucket. Um, but you can use that same technique instead of fighting fires with water, but you can maybe set air conditioning units on the top of a, you know, a roof, or you can do all sorts of different things. And in my case, mostly I've done um, moving drills, so there's an exploration that's looking for coal and you move these drills and they have different pieces and sections that need to be stacked and obviously they're too heavy for a person or two people to lift them and they're in the remote locations of Alaska so you can't haul in heavy equipment and tear up the tundra. So we do it all by helicopter. My name is Amy Sargent. I'm with the Florida Keys Mosquito Control. I'm the chief pilot, and we spray for mosquitoes. We both a larvicide and adulticide, which means um, that we're killing both mosquito larvae and adult mosquitoes using helicopters and fixed wing aircraft. When we larvicide, we have um, a spray system that puts out a granular pellet that has, it's actually ground up corn cob. It has a bacteria on it, and the mosquito larvae will eat the bacteria that comes off this ground up corn cob and it causes their stomach lining to rupture and killing the mosquito larvae. 
Um, to adult aside, we use a lip liquid product that we spray out of the uh, helicopter. We have 11 pilots here at the Mosquito Control. Um, seven of them are fixed wing and they're just part-time pilots. Um, and then there's four of us that are helicopter pilots. Our spray season normally runs from May to October. That's our busy season. Um, so during the off season then, we do a lot of training. Uh, everything we do is low level, right over the treetops, over wires, around towers, and um, I hate to use the term type A personality, but you do need to be a perfectionist. Um, I think any pilot, most pilots are, it's required. Um, I, sh I shouldn't say if it's, it's required, it's just, it's a, a skill that will help save your life because you can't be wrong. You start making mistakes and that chain of events is gonna lead to an accident. So you need to be a perfectionist. And that's what we train for. Helicopters are like thousands of little serial numbers that fly around together. You know, they uh, every one of these components has to be tracked and People don't realize how really safe helicopters are because of that very reason. They, uh, every component has a time and a, and a time life and an overhaul time. So the paperwork is really almost as important as the maintenance is in our jobs in the field because um, you know it's our responsibility to, uh, to maintain them according to what the FAA asks our company to do. We have such a process involved in everything we do here that nothing, nothing will go out of here if it's not ready. If, a, if it doesn't pass every certain test in succession, then the aircraft does not move forward. It's quite safe. Uh, my mother doesn't think so, but uh, it is very much so. There are aspects of being a test pilot that really take a special kind of person, a special constitution, and special abilities, both technical and, and professionally. I think a test pilot is above all a professional. They're not hot doggers, they're not cowboys, they're there to do a job. It's a very specific job as opposed to just go out and fly and have a good time and wrap it around itself. Not as opposed to other careers, but in aviation you need to become a professional. And the reason for that is probably obvious. Everything you do, somebody's life depends on it, including your own. You want to be precise about how you fly. You want to be responsible with your passengers. You want to be responsible when you're turning wrenches on the aircraft because somebody's going to fly your aircraft. That teaches you professionalism. It teaches you safety. It gives you pride about your work. And you actually get to see it fly or fly it yourself. And I think that is what really drew, drew me to aviation. To fly a helicopter, uh, both of your hands, both of your feet, uh, and your mouth are working. The first time they, they, uh, I started learning, I thought there is no way that I'm going to be able to do this. I was all over the place. I got in and the instructor took us up. He gave me one control and then he gave me two and then he said, okay, you have it. And I was convinced I had it and drifted about 30 feet. And uh, he's like, oh, you don't got it. So he took the controls back over. And I was pregnant at the time. The whole time I was training to be a helicopter pilot, I was pregnant. I think it's just like uh, everything else you learn, riding a bike, skateboard, everything takes a little bit of coordination and, um, and time. Once you get through it all, though, it's well worth it. And on the other side, it may not seem like it at the time when you're going through training. Uh, and then the difficult part after getting your initial training, and if you work as a CFI, building your hours, is to get a job. Uh, once you get your first turbine job, you got some experience, then it, it opens up a little bit more. And I think that that's probably like any other career. The more experience you have, the more skills you acquire, there's more options for you out there. When I, when I began working uh, for Sikorsky, I had already done uh, a lot of different jobs in the civilian and military industry. Um, I flew Hueys and Blackhawks in the Army and I went from uh, flying infantry soldiers around and yelling at them when we land, get out, get out, get out. You know, they have three seconds to get the heck out of the helicopter and we're gone, 
to uh, moving to Las Vegas and flying tours with somebody's grandma sitting next to me. Um, when I was five, I went to Germany to visit my grandmother. And my aunt was a flight attendant for Pan American at the time. And I got to serve the hotels, and I thought, I'm going to be a flight attendant. So from 5 to 18, I knew that's what I was going to do. So I applied to two major airlines, and they said, sorry. <laughs> and I went, what? So I said, OK, I'm going to be a pilot instead. Um, well, my full name is Amelia Earhart, like I said. Um, most people find that to be a little strange, so it draws a lot of attention, but my family is distantly related to the original Amelia Earhart, and I was named after her. Um, my family doesn't really have many ties to aviation. They just wanted to give me a name that was a positive female role model. They wanted to give me a name that nobody would ever forget, but they kind of let me find aviation on my own. It's kind of funny because I didn't want to fly helicopters. <laughs> they made me, um, and now I love it. My background is fixed wing. You know, I started flying when I was 15 years old. And, you know, I've flown corporate. I've flown uh, Lifelink for Lifelink 3. So that was um, air ambulance. And I flew for commuters. I flew for a charter company, Sun Country Airlines. Then I was on with Delta Airlines for a year. And then after 9-11, they furloughed 1,000 people, 1,100. And I was one of them. And. Um, when I found a job here at Mosquito Control as a part-time fixed-wing pilot, um, after a while, a position finally opened up where they created for an assistant chief pilot. They, I started doing that. Um, and then the position for chief pilot was opening up. And, but they required that the chief pilot be dual rated. And so they trained me to be a helicopter pilot. Well, helicopters are something that I think most people are at least vaguely interested in doesn't mean that everybody would necessarily want to work in a helicopter. So if you do get a job at a newsroom, usually you're going to have to work your way up to the helicopter. That's at least been my experience. But if you show interest as a reporter in just going up for a ride, maybe shadowing one of the reporters that works in the helicopter, I think that's a great opportunity. People who are in helicopters, and I know Chris agrees with this, you know, when somebody shows interest, we'll talk their ear off all day. I'm like, you want to see how I run the camera? Come on out. I'll just I'll spend two hours telling you about it because we love what we do. There's a lot of ways you can become an AMP mechanic. I'll give you a little background here. You can go to school for two years. There's people that were in the military as mechanics, but in order to get a civilian license, they have to submit that experience and they can take tests. Or you can work under an aircraft inspector like myself for three years, and that inspector can sign you off and you get your license. This is how I got mine. It's the hardest road to go, but you, you know what you're doing by the time you do get your license for sure. And uh, I actually have a degree in psychology. I was going to law school and took a summer job waxing airplanes and uh, World War II airplanes, and I never left aviation again. The Whirlier organization is quite unique. Uh, when I actually became a private pilot, they issue you a number, and I became 587. I believe there were over 1,700 now uh, internationally. Uh, what's really nice is if someone wants to forward their career uh, in aviation, they can actually apply for scholarships. Um, a few of my girlfriends have actually received scholarships, $5,000 scholarships on up. You certainly wouldn't want to invest a lot of time and money in something and find out later that you get motion sick and it just isn't for you and we have had that happen so first of all if somebody thinks they might be interested in doing this they they need to make sure that the actual field is for them the nursing field or the paramedic field and if that fits then there are opportunities to fly along with certain programs they do allow you to do that you get a, you get your feet wet decide and, and and usually you'll know right away oh this is for me uh, or this is not for me a lot of people go fixed wing and then they go over and add on the helicopter rating. I chose to just do it all in the helicopters. Um, I, that was where my heart was and my passion was. Basically, you have to love to fly and you have to like helicopters. It's not as glamorous as everybody makes it out to be, so if you're just looking for the image of being a helicopter pilot, it's a lot of work, and it, I mean, depending on where you go, it's still a job, it's still work, so you really must enjoy it. I get up at 3.15 in the morning, and that's horrible. You know, when that alarm goes off, I won't lie. 
I don't get up and go, yeah, I'm going to work. But the second I pull into the driveway here at the airport and I see that helicopter sitting out there on the ramp, that's when I go, all right, let's do it again. Let's see what's going to happen today because that's what's cool about this job. I never know. I, I flew for New York helicopters in 1988 and I actually took some time off and then now I'm back flying. And I, I, when I first got hired with the chief pilot here at Bristow, I think he had more confidence in myself than I did at the time. I had actually flown in 14 years. I decided to get married and have a family and actually thought my career was done. And uh, my dad passed away two years ago and that I think shocked me into life is short. And the only flying I was doing was in my dreams. You know, I'd, I'd look up and I'd see the helicopters and I'd tell my kids, oh, that's a A-star, there goes a jet ranger. And they're like, well, what's that? And I'm like, you know, I'm gonna get back into this. Your love for aviation could start at any age. You can be impacted by something at any age. And there are so many different jobs you can have in aviation. You can be good at math, you can be good at the arts, you can be good at reading. If you really like computer science, you can find a home in aviation. So if you have any interest at all, I really recommend just go to some small airport and talk to some of the pilots around there. If you want to get started in any kind of industry, you just need to start networking. Don't be shy, get out there and go for what you want to do. I never considered myself particularly special at anything. And look what I got to do. So I would just encourage you, if you have any interest at all, go check it out.